Uh, it is a privilege to welcome the newly minted Dr. Becky Ford to give the opening paper uh, for this series. Now, as many of you will already know, Dr. Ford is a recent graduate of the Institute for Northern Studies, where she successfully defended her thesis last month. Becky's research has explored the role of narrative in the formation and shaping of discourse communities, the idea of community as a creative dialogical process, and the importance of place in meaning making. And it is on that note that I'd like to hand over now to Dr. Ford to present her paper, Words and Waves, Exploring the Power of Stories, Community and Renewable Energy in Orkney. Dr. Ford. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks to everybody for coming along this evening. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. There we go. Okay, so as Andrew said, I've just very newly defended my thesis and it's lovely to be here in, uh, actually in the Institute for Northern Studies this evening. Um, so this evening, I'm going to draw on my recently defended thesis uh, to give you an overview of my research. My thesis title was actually Words and Waves, Ecological Dialogism as an Approach to Discourse, Community and Marine Renewable Energy in Orkney. However, tonight you will be pleased to know that I will only give a basic outline of ecological dialogism, which is a theoretical framework which informed my approach and understanding. And I'll focus on the stories that I encountered about community, energy and environment in Orkney and explain why I believe these stories are so important. As a location of the European Marine Energy Test Centre, or EMEC, Orkney has become a focus for an emerging marine renewable energy sector, bringing the local community into contact with individuals, organisations and ideas from across the globe. This interaction between the local community and the marine renewable energy sector is enacted through discourse, which engages with a range of local and global narratives, including energy policy, economic development, environmental protection and climate change. In the slide, you see the orbital marine O2 tidal turbine. At two megawatts, this is currently the largest floating tidal turbine in the world and is currently being tested at EMEX tidal test site at the Fall of Warness off the island of Edi. In my research, I wanted to look not only at the nature of the discourse around marine renewable energy and the range of narratives, but also to consider the environment these narratives emerge from the relationships they formed and the interactions they shaped. In doing so, I considered the role of narrative in me meaning making, challenging the idea of texts as purely physical products encoding fixed meanings. By exploring the relationships between oral and written language, storytelling and policy making, community and technology, I came to understand the fundamental importance of context in meaning making in terms of the socio-cultural context in which discourse takes place and the physical environment in which, is it, in which it is enacted. The starting point for this research was a desire to understand not only the impact of EMEC and marine renewable energy technology in Orkney, but the impact that Orkney has had on the wider renewable energy sector. Having grown up in Stromness, where EMEC is based, I was fascinated by the, by the idea of this new technology growing out of the global crisis of climate change being developed in what would be regarded by many as a remote location. I was also interested in how the new ideas and people coming into the community and the changes necessary to infrastructure and use of the marine space were affecting existing users, users of the marine environment. For me, community is best understood as process enacted through relationships between people and place. From my own interactions in the community, I had observed the central role of the storytelling process, the importance of where stories were told and who was telling them. To understand how stories might be shaping and responding to this new technology, I was going to need to find a way to combine and balance my position as a member of the Orkney community with my role as a researcher to find a way of doing research grounded in this relationship between people and place. My own relationship with place was shaped by my identity as a child of incomers to the islands. Although I was born and raised in Orkney, my parents are both originally from Liverpool 
and my experience of Arcadian culture and language was a something experienced outside the home, through my interactions in the wider community and at school. Language became a minefield for me, raising questions about my identity and problematising any claims of belonging to this place and community. Yet, dialect words, local place names, folk tales and everyday stories told by and about folk in the community directly shaped my own experiences and understanding of the world. My research has in turn been informed and shaped by this experience of community and is captured by the two quotes on this slide. The first from Stromless poet George Mackay Brown. It is the word, blossoming as legend, poem, story, secret, that holds a community together and gives a meaning to its life. The second quote from the Russian philosopher of language and literature, Mikhail Bakhtin. Language for the individual consciousness lies on the borderline between oneself and the other. The word in language is half someone else's. The living social nature of language captured by Brown is characterised by Bakhtin in terms of dialogism, an approach which sees language and communication as always both situated and interactional and inherently social. Bakhtin writes, we are taking language not as a system of abstract grammatical categories, but rather language conceived as ideologically saturated, language as a view, as a worldview, even as a concrete opinion, ensuring a maximum of mutual understanding in all spheres of ideological life. In his book, Rethinking Language, Mind and World Dialogically, Pearl and L offers an extended and applied version of Bakhtin's dialogism and argues for the term languaging to capture the active nature of the process of linguistic communication. This emphasis on language as a process of communication is crucial, reminding us that our use of language is always embodied and enacted. It is something that we actively do with our bodies, whether through vocalisation, making signs with our fingers, hands and arms, or even in the process of writing through our use of tools, to, through the use of the tools of writing, be that pen, keyboard or touch screen. There have been recent approaches to language and communication based on the four E's model borrowed from cognitive science. This model sees language as simultaneously embodied, enacted, extended and ecological. And I've given some examples of what I mean by that in the slide. I found this model extremely helpful as a foundation for developing my own thinking about the way meaning emerges from the act of languaging. From my observations, reading and thinking about how meaning was shaped through the process of community and the interaction between people and place, I have developed an approach I call ecological dialogism. Ecological dialogism recognises that meaning is emergent through interaction and relating within ecologies of meaning making which are both physical and cultural. While communication can be extended into time and space through the use of technologies from handwritten texts to digital online multimedia, each interaction involves particular people in particular places with particular experiences of the world. These experiences are formed through individual interactions with place, language and culture and through shared understandings and shared cultural narratives which emerge through the ongoing process of community. As a researcher, I am an active participant in these processes of meaning making. And in addressing the ethical implications of my involvement, I've been helped by the work of feminist thinker Donna Haraway, who problematizes the idea of the researcher as an objective obser observer of a subject. Haraway addresses the God trick of the objective view from nowhere in scientific discourse and explores the possibility of a feminist objectivity in her, fam in her famous paper, Situated Knowledge, the Science Question in Feminism and the Privilege of Partial Perspective. Haraway writes, all Western cultural narratives about objectivity are allegories of the ideologies of what we call mind and body of distance and responsibility embedded in the science question in feminism. Feminist objectivity is about limited location and situated knowledge, 
not about transcendence and splitting of subject and object. In this way, we might become answerable for what we learn how to see. Haraway is sensitive to the relationship between embodiment and action, what she calls response ability, the ability to respond to another being. She is aware of the potential of theory to act as both a useful tool and a potential distraction from learning how to see. Haraway writes, feminists don't need a doctrine of objectivity that promises transcendence, a story that loses track of its meditations just where someone might be held responsible for something and unlimited instrumental power. Her call is for an embodied theory that can address meaning in the world. She writes, we need the power of modern critical theories of how meanings and bodies get made, not in order to deny meaning and bodies, but in order to, li to live in meanings and bodies that have a chance for a future. For someone caught between the desire for wider understanding and the painful awareness of partial perspective, Haraway offered me hope. She writes, we seek those ruled by partial sight and limited voice, not partiality for its own sake, but rather for the sake of the connections and unexpected openings situated knowledges make possible. Situated knowledges are about communities, not about isolated individuals. The only way to find a larger vision is to be somewhere in particular. In her later publications, Haraway describes a natural cultural world which recognises entanglement and liminality, rejecting boundaries and binaries between the human and non-human, between nature, culture and technology. Natural cultural is written as one word, thus enacting the impossibility of separating the natural from the cultural. I saw this relational reality every day in my fieldwork, in the way communication was shaped by weather, in the way practical skills and knowledge of the environment were recognised and valued, in the way individuals re were referred to by the name of their farm or identified by their job. Individuals in Orkney must often negotiate complex entanglements of commitment between the personal and public domain, their identity woven from their roles and relationships within the community. Within these entanglements, are relationships of authority and power, which are enacted, negotiated and enforced through discourse. This process of relational meaning making is very clearly dialogical and is for me the very definition of community. So what are the shared narratives and situated knowledges of discourse in Orkney? In his book, The Norwegian Scots, an anthropological interpretation of Viking Scottish identity in the Orkney Islands, Michael Lang identifies the history of the islands and the small population as important factors in a resistance to hierarchical divisions within the social structure. Lang points out how this is coupled with a sense of independence through the community members working together to achieve their goals without the need for help from the outside. As a result, Community discourse and individual behaviour in Orkney is shaped by powerful and mutually self, uh, by powerful shared narratives, which characterise the Orkney community as egalitarian, collaborative and mutually self-reliant. And Orkney is a place with a distinct and special identity grounded in its long history. To conform to this narrative of egalitarianism, individuals must avoid being bigsy. Bigsy is the Orcadian dialect term for being conceited. In Lang's words, quote, to be bigsy is to be full of oneself, overly proud of individual achievement or a self-promoter. The underlying tenet of being bigsy is a sense of being better than other people and to think you are better than others is unacceptable in Orkney. Bigsiness reflects an egalitarian sensibility that is a strong and conscious part of what many people consider to be a typically Orcadian way of life. While individual bigsiness is policed in self and others, often through the use of humour to avoid direct criticism that could damage relationships, there is at the same time an acceptance and indeed an expectation 
that members of the community will, be po will positively promote the islands. As one of my informants put it, you can be as begsy as you like about Orkney. Within the renewable energy sector in Orkney, this is expressed in the way individuals and organisations who might ordinarily be considered as competitors come together to collaborate as part of what is often referred to as Team Orkney. This can be seen in the work of the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum, or ORF, which I will come back to talk about later. And it's seen in the way that presentations, publications and events produced by the energy sector emphasise the importance of Orkney, showcasing the islands as a destination not only for travel, but for business, and promote local culture and products alongside the promotion of the island's renewable technologies and services. The slide shows the energy page from the Orkney.com website. Orkney.com is a partnership between Orkney Islands Council and Highlands and Islands Enterprise to promote Orkney and support economic activity in the islands. Energy is one of the four industry groups alongside tourism, craft and food and drink, which is showcased as part of the Orkney brand. The story of Team Orkney goes beyond marketing and can be witnessed in the reaction to what I describe as the narrative of disappointment within the renewable energy sector. The narrative of disappointment emerged from a series of events revealing the power of stories and illustrates the importance of how stories are told, where, when and by whom. In 2010, the Crown Estate, who managed the seabed around Orkney, leased 10 sites for commercial wave and tidal energy developments. The successful bidders were a mixture of utility companies and technology developers. The Crown Estate holds crown, la crown lands, and in this case the seabed, with the remit to maximise income from its assets. Income from the Orkney seabed leases at that time would have gone directly to the UK Treasury. However, following the 2014 referendum on Scottish independence, the Smith Commission recommended that management of Crown Estate assets in Scotland and their revenues should be devolved to Scotland, with the establishment of Crown Estate Scotland in 2016, following the Scotland Act. During the leasing process in 2010, the Crown Estate set developers the challenge of generating 1.2 gigawatts of electricity by 2020, the equivalent of the power needed by 750,000 homes. Having, having spoken to various folk from the marine renewable energy sector, this was never a realistic figure. The feeling I have heard expressed is that the Crown Estate were encouraging developers to overestimate and provide best case projections to encourage investment. The reality was the techn technology was far from ready. As one of my informants put it, it was like asking the Wright brothers to build Concord. In my fieldwork, I heard marine renewable energy described by those outside the sector as a failure, a joke, and even a scam. While some in the general public might see marine renewable energy as a magnet for public funding, the reality was that the majority of technology developers rely on private investment. This is a world where intangible factors such as investor confidence can make or break a company. Unfortunately for marine renewable energy and wave technology in particular, the expectations raised by the Crown Estate and the subsequent narrative of disappointment led investors to pull out. In her book, Energy at the End of the World, an Orkney Island saga. Laura Watts recounts her experience of meeting Andrew, a venture capital scout visiting Orkney looking for, in Watts' words, an origin story for marine energy, a naturalised out of Orkney account of wave and tidal energy with a few Viking runes and longships thrown in. Watts is clear about the powerful role of storytelling in securing investment for technology development. She writes, Andrew is from a land of unicorns, startup tech companies valued at over a billion dollars. He knows something of myths and their importance in making futures within the tech world. He seems to, to know that stories are crucial to making the future, to making people believe in a future strong enough that they will buy into it, and more than that, 
live in it as though it were the present. Contrary to what you might expect, when it comes to future making, when it comes to tech innovation, what matters is not balancing the accounting spreadsheet, but the story you can tell. Watts uses this incident to explore Edwin Muir's characterization of Orkney in terms of story and fable, suggesting that, quote, factual stories are inseparable from the fables that arise from their retelling. The story told by the Crown Estate was inevitably short on facts and was immediately being retold and reimagined by a range of voices from a range of perspectives. In the news story of the announcement that I read on the Renewable Energy Focus website, there were numerous quotes, notably from the then Scottish First Minister, Alex Salmond, who said, these waters have been described as a Saudi Arabia of marine power and the wave and tidal projects unveiled today exceeding the initial 700 megawatt target capacity, underline the rich natural resources of the waters of Scotland. And William Rowe, Chair of Highlands and Islands Enterprise said, this announcement signals a first step towards the commercialisation of marine renewable energy generation from the Pentland Firth and Orkney waters. Amidst the myth building, it was easy to miss the note of caution sounded by Niels Creek, CEO at Palamis Wave Power. He said, the challenges associated with the ambitions which have been set today are significant. The narrative of disappointment characterises the failure to meet the Crown Estate targets as a failure of the technology, leading to a decline in investor confidence in the story of marine renewable energy. Without investment, developers did indeed fail, but for economic rather than technical reasons. As a result, two of the leading wave energy device developers, Palamis and Aquamarine Power, went into administration within a year of each other. Palamis in November 2014 and Aquamarine Power in November 2015. In the slide, you can see the fate of the Palamis Sea Snake wave device, which had been at EMEC from almost the beginning of the wave test site at Pitbilia Crew. The final photo is one I took of it sitting at the Copeland's Dock Pier waiting to be carted away after being decommissioned. During my fieldwork in 2016 to 2017, I started attending meetings of the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum, OREF for short, and got permission to shadow their board meetings. I was beginning to understand that despite the narrative of disappointment, there was another story about renewable energy in Orkney. And in this case, the plot twist was caused by exceeding rather than failing to meet expectations of energy production. In both cases, these were stories of how political, social and economic power was entangled with the physical infrastructure of energy generation and transmission. In 2013, Orkney produced 103% of its electricity needs from renewable sources. By 2016, this had risen to 120% and in 2020, that had risen again to 128%. As you can see from the slide, which I put together from banner images off the ORF website, this is due in large part to the high uptake of domestic level micro renewables, mainly micro wind turbines, with, over, with nearly 10% of the population in Orkney making their own power from micro renewables. However, unfortunately, the Orkney electricity grid was not designed for generation. It had been built to import energy from sites of production in the south, crossing the Pentland Firth through two 33 kilovolt interconnector cables, a main cable and a spur, and then being distributed around the islands through a network of undersea, underground and overhead cables, which was developed in stages from the initial connection of the main towns of Kirkwall and Stromness in 1947 to the surprisingly recent final edition of North Romsey in 1983. Many islanders, particularly those in the smaller North Isles, can well remember what it's like to live off grid. Because the existing internet connector was not designed to export energy, it cannot cope with all those Orkney electrons, as Laura Watts calls them. In simple terms, it gets hot, in fact, is in danger of melting. 
the network operator in Orkney, South, Southern, Scottish and Southern Electricity, called a moratorium on new generation connections in 2012 and implemented a smart grid approach using active network management technology to monitor real-time production in order to avoid overloading the interconnector during periods of peak generation. While this allows the grid infrastructure to operate at optimum capacity, it also means renewable devices must be curtailed during periods of high production. Often, it is the bigger community-owned turbines that are switched off, losing both revenue and feed-in tariff for the communities. For the marine renewable energy sector, grid constraints threaten to undermine the work of EMEC as developers were seeking, were seeking to test larger devices and arrays of devices and if there had been a constraint in Emacs connection, they might, they might have looked elsewhere. The local response was one of increased collaboration and innovation and saw the development of hydrogen projects such as Surf and Turf and Big Hit and smart grid projects, Heat Smart Opney and Smile. These brought together local companies such as Emac. Aquaterra and other local supply chain companies, with organisations such as Community Energy Scotland, Orkney Islands Council, Harriet Watts ICIT campus and community-owned wind turbines. It also involved external bodies, including the EU, Scottish Government and academic and industry partners. These projects used a range of technologies to responsibly increase local demand or provide energy storage capacity in order to facilitate renewable ele electricity generation and avoid curtailment. Basically, they, they produce demand on the system when supply is likely to threaten the interconnector. These and other projects, including the current £28.5 million UKRI funded Reflex project to create an integrated energy system in, in Orkney, have all required a significant amount of invisible work the relationship and trust building, which are essential foundations upon which collaboration is built. The response to the narrative of disappointment with Orkney shows how the situated process of community offers alternative stories of power based on sharing understanding of people and place and the relationships between them. Understanding these responses in terms of ecological dialogism emphasises the importance of relationships of responsibility and answerability based on shared experiences and mutual concern. With so much at stake, how can the energy islands make sure their stories, full of local knowledge and relational understanding, become part of the official stories of those in positions of power? As Maria Quiche de la Bella Cashler points out, quote, even more than before, knowledge is relating while thinking, researching, storytelling, wording, accounting, matters in the mattering of worlds. Or, to quote Donna Haraway, it matters what stories tell stories. It matters whose stories tell stories. Stories of power as energy in Orkney matter, not just in the islands, but as part of the wider story of energy in an Anthropocene future shaped by climate crisis and environmental chaos. In a critical reading of Bruno Latour's Matters of Concern as Matters of Care, Puig de la Bella Casa argues for, quote, the need for a practice of care is something we can do as thinkers and knowledge creators, fostering also more awareness about what we care for and about how this contributes to mattering the world. Pishtala Bellacasa suggests that, as a transformative ethos, caring is a living technology with vital material implications for human and non-human worlds. Pishtala Bellacasa's work resonates strongly with my experiences during fieldwork, which demonstrated not only the power of stories, but the importance of the care that went into their telling, rooted in relationships between people and place. It shaped my understanding and informed my own practice as I came to see the powerful influence of care as a living technology, which, is, which was entangled in and actively shaping the development of the renewable energy sector in Orkney. 
Ecological dialogism reveals the value of situated knowledges and interdependencies understood in terms of care, helping us to see them not as fixed positions to be adopted or ideal states to be achieved, but as processes which can be understood and enacted within our own context and through our own discourses. Careful storytelling skills turned the threat of grid constraint and curtailment into an opportunity for new innovative technology projects based on collaboration both locally and with outside organisations. Ecological dialogism draws attention to the way shared cultural narratives combine with the embodied day-to-day -day interactions of island life to shape the, processes of, the process of community in Orkney, just as the shared grid infrastructure has shaped the development of energy technology in the islands. As my own relationship to the renewable energy sector in Orkney deepened, I came to recognise the community ethos of cohesion and mutual aid, not only in the stories I was hearing, but in the behaviour of the individuals and organisations making up the sector. There was an identifiable commitment, sense of commitment to work together for the benefit not only of the energy sector, but for the Orkney community as a whole. I came to understand that the successes of the sector reflected not only the ability to exploit Orkney's natural resources of wind, wave and tide, but the ability to use care as a living technology by drawing on and integrating the Orkney community's cultural narratives and practices into its ways of working and relating. A central experience of my fieldwork was the opportunity to shadow board meetings of OREF, the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum. This helped me to understand that relationships within the renewable sector were continuously navigating between the need for collaboration and the pressure of competition. Formed in 2000, ORF is an organisation, a membership organisation, with the following aims and objectives. To encourage the preferential use of renewable energy in Orkney, to debate the best technical and sustainable options for increasing renewable energy and energy efficiency in Orkney, to facilitate research and development in renewable energy and energy efficiency, to disseminate information on renewable energy and energy efficiency, to lobby on the strategic issues affecting the development of the renewable energy sector in Orkney, and to act as a consultative body on issues relating to connecting Orkney to renewable energy markets. The 12 directors who make up the ORF board meet monthly, with the board meeting followed by an open public meeting which usually takes the form of a presentation and discussion on some aspect of renewable energy. The ORF membership is made up of a mixture of businesses of various sizes, interested members of the public, students and researchers. Meetings alternate between venues in Stromness and Kirkwall, and currently online, in recognition of the fact that members have to travel to meetings from different parts of the Orkney mainland. Evidence of an awareness of local tensions between East and West Mainland and the potential to be accused of limiting access to meetings. It's interesting to note that despite accusations of increasing centralisation of local services and developments in Kirkwall, the renewable sector is predominantly based in Stromness at the old academy site, which has recently been redeveloped as the Orkney Research and Innovation Campus, which you see in the top picture of the slide and uh, the, the building at the front is the old primary school which is part of the campus and the buildings on the top left of the picture are the old academy buildings. As I attended meetings at the, and got to know the board of directors I realised the importance of location and proximity for the ecology of meaning making of the ORF board. Board members were there as volunteers in their spare time organising and attending meetings in the evening after work. But in their day jobs, they were key players in the renewable sector who regularly met each other in the course of their working days. Board meetings often included, included references to these previous encounters and conversations. And to begin with, I sometimes struggled to follow the blurred lines between a director's day job and their role in ORF. The board was engaged in an ongoing dialogue which took place across multiple meetings, locations and contexts, including informal conversations in corridors and car parks, along the street and in local shops. 
the nature of the physical environment in Stromness, the close proximity of organisations in the old academy buildings, the narrow lanes leading down to the single main street, and the limited number of shops and cafes provided ample opportunities for chance meetings and informal conversations. These meetings and the informal interactions at board meetings over tea and biscuits were all important aspects of forming and maintaining relationships which were about more than the business at hand, while also essential to it. The unpaid work being carried out by directors demonstrated care on multiple levels, from a desire to achieve success for the renewable energy sector in the islands and sharing the benefits with the wider community, to an understanding of Orkney's role in developing technologies which, which could contribute to the global response to climate change. That ORF's activities also benefit benefited the member organisations was part, was part of the point and also one of the challenges. One of the key strengths of the organisation was its ability to bring together individuals from across the private and public sector, allowing them to act together on issues which might otherwise have proved, proved politically sensitive or divisive. Acting under the ORF banner opened up the scope for collaborations, providing a neutral space for joint action particularly around lobbying or consul consultation responses. As one board member put it, ORF acts as a useful cloak you can borrow, allowing collaboration in circumstances where competitive pressure in the business realm might have prevented this happening. I was struck by the way in which the narrative of ORF as a shared identity which could helpfully override personal differences or conflict mirrored the way Orkney was similarly called upon to present an idealised version of community egalitarianism and cohesion in the face of the unequal and conflicted reality. In lots of ways, the ORF story directly draws on the wider Orkney story, and there was one particular meeting that illustrated this for me, while also reinforcing the role of power in this process of careful storytelling. Scottish and Southern Electricity or to be specific, the branch of the company that deals with network distribution, Scottish Hydroelectric Power Distribution, or SHEPD for short, were in the islands carrying out a consultation on options for replacing the cables between some of the North Isles. There had been a number of events at various locations in Orkney as part of the consultation, but ORF had invited the SHEPD representative along to the open monthly meeting to give a presentation and receive feedback from ORF members. It was a particularly well attended meeting and I was aware of the significance of who was in attendance. Board members were often very busy and might not always stay for the public meeting if they had pressing deadlines the next day. The meeting opened with a presentation by the ORF chair on cable laying options and the environmental impact associated with the different approaches. This was in response to a proposal by Maroon Scotland that all new subsea electricity cables should be buried or protected. A decision which the ORF board was concerned added prohibitive costs to the laying and maintenance of cables and was not based on evidence of negative impacts to either the marine environment or local fisheries being caused by existing cables. The presentation pointed out that various methods of burying or protecting cables in themselves gave rise to significant levels of ecological impact and that the existing cables had been in place for over 30 years with relatively low failure rates. The issue of the impact to local fisheries was addressed in terms of the need for engagement with local fishermen and in planning cable routes which would minimise disruption and avoid potential conflicts or risks of cable damage. Having sat through this initial presentation, the representative from SHEPD then made his presentation about the three subsea cables they were intending to replace between Rousey and Westry, Stronsey and Shappensea, and Shappensea and the mainland. The purpose of the consultation was to hear local opinions about the routing of the cables and the methods of protection considered most appropriate by islanders. So far, so straightforward. I was struck by the fact that the Shepney representative looked quite young and I wondered whether he realised before the meeting that he was going to be presented to as much as he was going to get to present. Shepney might have genuinely been looking for local responses, but I got the impression that the ORF response was not entirely what they had expected. 
The feedback session after the Shepley presentation took a turn which had me scribbling furiously in my notebook and inwardly smiling as the full force of Team Orkney and Orkney PLC went to work. I was delighted to find a write-up of the meeting on the ORF website afterwards, which reinforced that what I had witnessed was a very deliberate piece of strategic lobbying. The message that ORF wanted to get across regarding the potential impact of the Marine Scotland policy change was clearly articulated in the write-up. It reads, It was clear that the overwhelming feedback from the attendees was that any deviation from straightforward surface laying could and should only be justified based upon a demonstrable risk basis. And the, feel, and the feel was that the current policy position of Marine Scotland in this regard was untenable. With regards to routings, the attendees saw no particular problems in following existing routes, other than ensuring that they were compatible with proposed tidal energy development potential. What followed is described in the ORF write-up as follows. A final presentation about the range of cable related activities and interests within the supply chain. The material presented showcased the breadth and depth of cable related experience within Orkney, highlighting in particular the estimated 150 people in Orkney who have worked in one way or another on cabling related projects, studies and activities. I remember it as the moment when the Shep D representative suddenly realised the evening had taken an unexpected turn, as the combined force of the ORF board began their sales pitch. Even the language of the website, website write-up acknowledges the change of mood. It says, The case was strongly made for greater involvement of the Orkney supply chain in all future cable works in Orkney and indeed elsewhere. And Shepty indicated that a major opportunity for bidding into a new supply framework would be likely to arise in early 2017. Notwithstanding this opportunity, ORF sought further reassurance that the capacity that Orkney PLC could provide to support any cabling activity would be taken into better account in the future. The Shepty representative offered to pass on the information he had received to other colleagues and it will be up to ORF and its members to further pursue opportunities with Shepty and wider SSE in the future. It's interesting to see the way Orkney PLC is used to describe what the ORF board members were trying to get across to the rather overwhelmed Shepty representative, who probably arrived thinking the point of the meeting was for him to do the presenting. At the ORF meeting with Shepty, I was witnessing Orkney PLC in action promoting the local supply chain, while at the same time urging Shep D to engage more collaboratively with the process of making Orkney's energy future. In the official report of the event, this was expressed in relation to the capacity of the cables proposed for the North Isles links, but needs to be read with an awareness of the wider context of frustrations over grid constraint, turbine curtailment, and the thorny question of the potential for a second interconnector across the Pentland Firth. The report reads, there was also keen interest over the capacity of cables that were proposed for the works, with a plea made by ORF and the attendees for much earlier and meaningful engagement at the initial planning and design stages of the planning process. The concern being that the proposed cables are in fact undersized for the future energy management needs within Orkney, and that there should be greater coordination between communications and energy functions of cables. Perhaps my favourite moment of the whole meeting was when one ORF director asked if there would be any offcuts from the new cable and what would be happening to the cables that were being replaced. While another director, in relation to getting Marine Scotland to reconsider the need to bury or protect the new cables, asked, how can, how can Team Orkney help? Having shared this particular story, I would like to conclude by considering why these stories matter. Val Plumwood identifies the importance of a movement from a monological to a dialogical conception of the human self and its possibilities for a relationship to the non-human world, noting that such a reframing is necessary to move, quote, quote, towards the kinds of structures of relationship we need to develop to begin addressing the environmental crisis at the level of culture. In my research, I have attempted to show how these dialogical relationships between people and place are already actively shaping discourse in Orkney, 
and have, as a result, shaped the development of renewable energy technologies in the islands. Like Palmwood, I believe that we need better stories to understand an environmental crisis which reflects our estrangement from ourselves, each other and the natural world. And I would suggest that the first step is to de develop our skills in telling and listening to different stories. When we hear and tell stories, we need to be careful to listen for the authoritative voices and the silenced voices. How is a story situated? What power does it have or seek to draw on? Stories help us most when they are grounded in real experiences of the world, when they have touched, smelt and heard the places they talk about and are in an ongoing relationship with them. Careful storytelling is about listening as much as speaking, staying curious about the ecology in which stories live and the relationships they are part of. In approaching the marine renewable energy and wider renewable energy sector in Orkney through the stories told about it, I came to understand the way in which these stories, and crucially how, where and by whom they were told, could shape events. While the importance of renewable energy to the island economy and the prof profile of EMEC within the international marine renewable energy sector have led to a narrative of Orkney as the energy islands, the evidence gathered during my fieldwork suggests that alongside the undeniable technical achievements and expertise, there's a vast amount of invisible work which is missing from official accounts. I observed this invisible work in the way stories and storytelling were used to establish and maintain relationships between individuals and organisations within the renewable energy sector, creating a shared narrative about Team Orkney, aka Orkney PLC, aka Orkney Limited. This powerful narrative is in dialogue with and shares the characteristics of the narrative of the Orkney community as cohesive, collaborative and self-reliant and it acts to shape behaviour within the sector. This can be observed in the high levels of collaboration between individuals and organisations within the sector, with individual conflicts and competitions skillfully navigated by emphasising a shared identity as part of Team Orkney and focusing on the potential for mutual benefit in acting collectively. The story of Team Orkney is told in multiple places and by multiple storytellers and can be encountered in various forms in official texts, perhaps most notably those produced by Orkney Renewable Energy Forum. In recognising the importance of this narrative in the achievements of the renewable energy sector, I would argue that this story and its telling represent an example of Maria Puig de la Bella Casas' characterisation of care as a living technology. My research has shown that this living technology of care has been integral to the development of Orkney's renewable energy sector. In highlighting how this previously invisible work of care is enacted through stories and storytelling, I hope my research can contribute to a clearer understanding of its importance and that rather than remaining invisible, this work can be acknowledged, valued and learned from. I also hope that by understanding the power of stories, we can, as Plumwood suggests, begin addressing the environmental crisis at the level of culture. To do this, we need stories which reimagine our relationships with energy and environment and with each other. Stories which can help us shape a sustainable future in Orkney and beyond. Thank you. Very much, Becky. That was absolutely fascinating, and I I know for my, for myself that I've got several questions that I want to ask you, but uh, I'll hold off and I'll bite my tongue just now because I see that we've got quite a few in the chat box. Um, the first one is from Julie, and she asks: the Arcadian economy is currently, or at least before COVID, led by tourism followed by farming. How long before renewable energy becomes an economic leader in our islands? Uh, I think there would be an argument to say that it's already very strongly part, I mean, the fact that it exists as one of the four sectors that's being actively promoted. Um, certainly, um, employment levels within the sector are increasing. At the height of the kind of pre-narrative of dis uh, disappointment, we think we're up around 400 jobs 
associated with the sector. I don't think we can be very far off that now, with especially with the development of the Reflex project. And I think the important thing to stress as well is that these are high level graduate jobs and technical jobs, which are allowing young Acadians to come back into the islands. I mean, certainly my, you know, in my generation, if you went away and did a degree, you weren't coming back unless you were lucky enough to get a teaching or a, or a, a job as a doctor or nurse. You know, you were, you were leaving and not coming back. Whereas now there are so many more opportunities for young people to come back and, and become, you know, re return to the islands. Superb. Um, I'm just noticing that there's there's a lot of messages coming in saying uh, that people thoroughly enjoyed the the, uh, the paper. Um, Mairead's just asked, Mairead has a question, but she's also asked, could you pop the references slide back up? Oh yeah, sure. Um, uh, can you maybe can you let me share again, please, Andrew? I think that's uh, Oshin's uh, working in the backdrop there. Oh, sorry, I've jumped the gun. I've pressed the wrong thing. Hang on. And I'll put the... There we go. Sorry, it's kind there of... Small. I had trouble fitting them all on. Oh, I'm sure that's fine. Um, so we have actually a, a question from Mairead here. Uh, Mairead says, that was fantastic. Do you feel that as an inhabitant, inhabitant sorry, uh, of Orkney, you were restricted in any way during your research since you were living with the people you were researching? That's a really good question. Absolutely. And I wrote quite a lot in my thesis about this, you know, the sense of uh, how I was implicated in the research. I know that there were times when there were things that I got people and opportunities I got access to that I wouldn't have had if I was coming in from the outside. But I also know that there were things that I didn't pursue and, you know, I was definitely, you know, I, I, found, I found that by the end of my stint of fieldwork, I was definitely, had become a part of Team Orkney and was also asking, how can I help? What can I do? Uh, and full disclosure, I ended up once I'd finished shadowing the board, I ended up as a board member of OREF. So uh, full disclosure there, the, there is absolutely this entanglement between the researcher and the field site. And it's ongoing. I think, you know, it, it makes it a very particular experience. And I'm, I'm very, I hope that I'm very clear that this is my version of the story. It's not the version of the story. And I don't think, to be honest, I don't think there is a singular ver ever a singular version of the story but that, that's a really good question and I and I think I also had an experience where I went and presented south and was in a situation where I it became apparent that, so, that somebody in the audience had also been trying to research the sector in Orkney and had had a very different experience of Team Orkney as somebody coming from outside and maybe finding it harder to get access to people so yeah it's uh, it definitely changes the experience. Brilliant. There is a mountain of questions coming in. So it's obviously uh, an incredibly topical uh, paper. Uh, I've got one from Julie and Annie who ask, um, we produce 120% of the energy we need, but we live in fuel poverty. How can we fix this? Surely Orkney should have cheap energy. Oh. Whose job is it to put that in place? There's a grenade for you. You can oh. jump on that if you want. <laughs> right. Well, there's, again, there's a lot in the thesis about this. I think the simple answer, and I'm going to be really honest, the simple answer is capitalism. That's the problem. Orkney's problems with electricity are not technical. They are not about, you know, if it was if it was simply a question of we're making too much energy and the grid can't cope, if we could just, you know, give electricity away or sell, you know, sell it cheap, then there wouldn't be a problem because everybody in Orkney would have warm and cosy houses, there'd be no fume poverty and everybody who's generating electricity could generate as much as they want. The problem is the setup of electricity as a market means that you've got you know, competition. You've also got, uh, you know, SSE are a company that are in lots of the little different bits. One of them are the grid, the network operator. You know, one of them, are, you know, a company that sells you your electricity, another lot are responsible for distribution, another lot, yeah, and, and so, you know, fix fix things when the poles fall down. The, the connection between fuel poverty in Orkney and our vast wealth of renewable resource 
is it's just so galling, it's just so galling because there isn't a simple fix for it, and the um, some of the uh, projects that I spoke about, like Surf and Turf, the big hit, now particularly Reflex, I try you know they're trying to address fuel poverty as part of what they're doing by looking at ways of kind of circumventing the, 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 the issues around the market but it it isn't a, it isn't an easy fix it's about politics and it's about economics ultimately we have a question from Oshin uh, who asks, is this shared narrative of Orkney PLC seen in all major sectors in Orkney? For example, does it appear in farming, tourism and food production? I'm going to speak not knowing particularly in depth about those areas, but I would say in general, yes. I mean, I think, you know, just the fact that you've got the Orkney.com website acting as a showcase for these sectors, I think is probably indicates that it is. There's certainly a sense in which you know, Orkney as a brand is promoted within these sectors. Um, so yes, I mean, I think this sense of the sense of the shared that there's a thing called Orkney and we can stick it, stick that label on things, makes them, it gives them that added something, which which just being from Orkney seems to bring with it. We have actually connected to that. We have a similar question from Julie, um, who asks, has anyone recorded oral histories focused on people's experiences throughout their lives of energy and connectivity? Lives must have changed so much in recent years in the development of connectivity and energy. That is a really good question. And I don't actually know the answer. I know there has been some work around Orkney's energy history. In fact, there's a, there's a really good project that's been going on just recently uh, with our colleagues in the archaeology department, uh, Dan Lee, who um, has been doing work with Richard Irving on the um, energy landscapes. And they've been looking, they've been going out and doing field work at sites connected with energy in Orkney. So I think most recently, they've been in ED looking at peak cutting, but they've been at Billy Crew looking at the wave test site. They've been at Burger Hill looking at the um, wind turbine sites there and at Costa Head, where, of course, we had the UK's first grid connected wind turbine back in the 50s, which unfortunately blew down in the first really good gale. But the, the, the concrete um, pad that it was based on is still up there on the hill to be seen. But yes, I think having oral oral histories of people's experience of electricity, and especially you know, you know, when it, for other places the idea of micro wind is seen as being something very kind of new and exotic, whereas in Orkney, uh, one of the experiences I had was going out to ED and the farmer who sold the land to EMEC for the tidal test site. Uh, I got I got to go and meet him and he was amazing, had all these fabulous stories, but he also took me out into a shed where he had this amazing Lucas Freelight uh, wind turbine, which must have dated from somewhere in the 1930s or 40s, which he lovingly restored to working order. And, you know, so this these were common around farms in Orkney at that time because they provided, you know, lighting for, for the farmhouse. And there's a great story in... Um, Howie Firth's anthology of stories in from the Couths, where uh, Davy Hutchison talks about uh, being disappointed and not being able to get a diesel generator to watch the football at his Croft and Rackwick, but ends up managing to, somebody finds him a, an old Lucas Freelight and he gets that set up and the, the day is saved after all. I wonder if I might abuse my position as chair to ask a, a follow-on question to that. Um, when you mentioned this idea of authoritative voices and silent voices, have you found there that there's a difference between the attitude of ORF at that kind of higher level to the sentiment within the wider community? Or is it pretty much a shared uh, perspective? Oh, no. I mean, the, the stories depend on who you are and what your relationship is with re with, renew with renewable energy. So, for example, uh, one of the things that I encountered frequently were people, well, there were the, the folk who thought the whole marine renewable energy thing was a scam and a kind of money. I think someone referred to it almost as a money laundering scheme to extract public money into the supply chain. And that was based, you know, very clearly on the, the 
uh, events of the kind of characterize the narrative of disappointment, this idea that the perception was that there were large amounts of public money being pumped into the sector and that these were actually you know, pieces of technology which weren't economically viable. The misunderstanding, of course, being that the technology just wasn't at that stage. We were building a new technology, a new energy technology from scratch with minimal public support. You know, actually, if you think about the money that went into uh, the, the nuclear sector, but I mean, even in renewables, if we think what the Danish government did in terms of getting behind and, and supporting the development of wind technology in Denmark, you know, marine renewals have seen you know a tiny fraction of support from public funds so it's back to you know private investment but maybe the the place where you see this disparity in in attitudes towards renewables is the difference between people who've been able to take advantage of having micro wind generation you know people who could afford to invest in the technology at the time when again we're back to policy when government policy was to provide the feed-in tariff subsidies which made it, you know, it, it made it a really good idea to invest money in micro renewables because you were getting for, for the, the electricity that you were generating, you were getting paid for it by putting it into the grid, but you were also getting the feed-in tariff on top of that. So you, you know, people were in a position to be able to actually borrow money and make a make a profit and pay back their investment. So the difference for people who were able to do that compared with people maybe living next door with elements of maybe light and sound pollution from the, the turbine and also with high levels of electricity bills and living in fuel poverty. So absolutely the perception and the, the relationship with the technology differs very much depending on what, what your personal relationship with that technology is. Mm. And again, actually linked into that is um, a question from uh, Matthew Nicholson who, um, and apologies, uh, Matthew, because the question was cut in half as it was sent through to the chat there. But um, Matthew is comparing the kind of reception in Shetland uh, to the Viking energy wind farm in comparison to the experiences that you've been talking about in Orkney and how perhaps that's the reason why there's uh, there's less of a established story in Shetland as there is in Orkney. Yeah, I mean, I mean Shetland haven't been attached to the grid up until you know, this new, this new uh, project. So the opportunities for that kind of level of adoption of micro renewables and community level turbines hasn't been the same. And again, you know, people's, people's relationship to the technology depends on, on their own personal relationship to it. I had a wonderful story from one of the, the development trusts who'd invested in a community turbine and they had you know, spoken to the people in the community and there were people, there was this one lady in particular who was not keen on it. She was worried about the impact it was going to have visually because it was within her line of sight. And the community turbines are quite big. And then it had been explained to her that every time the turbine blades went round, it made seven pence for the community. And that this was money that was going to go into supporting additional services and opportunities for, for the community. And I think this was in Shackensey, I think, where they, they were able to put on an out of hours ferry service to allow folk to get in into Kirkwall to go to the theatre or to attend appointments or just to have that extra flexibility of, of access. And when, when this lady found out how much the community was benefiting from the turbine, her relationship with it completely changed to the point where she actually asked her family to lower the dike at the front of her, the front of her garden so that she could get a better view of the turbine. So that I was saying that's just a lovely example of how, you know, again, the things will be different in Shetland, how this relationship changes depending on how, how that benefit, whether that seemed to be a mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah, whether they can develop that kind of symbiotic uh, relationship going forward. Uh, we have another question from Caroline, um, who says, that was really interesting, Becky. How would you define story? I've always thought of stories as having an element of fiction and narrative as mixed. But is that just a definition that I have made up? I think that's the common perception of stories. But I think I would challenge that by saying everything is story. You know, we, we, we tell the stories of our lives. We tell events that happen they're always told 
from a position. They always, they, there's always a teller and, and an audience. You know, I, back team's dialogism comes from the idea that it's not, there's not a kind of monological version of things where we can say, well, this is the facts of the matter. They're told with the expectation of a response. And so language and language carries with it. There are some fabulous Bakhtin quotes, which didn't make it in tonight, but Bakhtin talks about the way, you know, words and language carry with them the taste of where they've previously been, you know. They, he says something like, it's not out of the dictionary that a speaker gets their words, but out of the mouths of others, and it's from there that they have to make them their own. So you know, words have associations. This is where shared meaning making comes from. You know, we, we, we come to langu language in relationship with the people around us. And that's where that's how we achieve shared understanding and shared meaning making because we we have an experience of language with other people and so storytelling is our way of putting ourselves into language so for me a story is anything you know a news report a piece of gossip on the street everything is a story Everything has an angle, everything has an accent and a, and a flavour and a, an attitude that goes along with it. Kind of goes back to what Edwin Muir was talking about, the story in the fable. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, we've got another question in from uh, Dan Lee. Uh, Thanks for a really interesting talk and the mention of Orkney Energy <laughs> Landscapes. I was going to ask how you see the expansion of the energy story, both materially and temporarily, to include more traditional energy sources such as peat and oil, and how this can help contextualise the Orkney renewable industry and broader narratives in Scotland? I think that's a really good question, Dan, and I think it's really important that we do see a, a whole picture for energy, because the challenges that are coming are going to be significant, and it's really easy to tell a story about renewables where it's all about the shiny technology and it can often exclude the realities of what you know what that can actually do it's not that the technology isn't necessary and isn't important but that if we don't understand that that story in context if we don't understand where it comes from and where it where we where it's going and we you know we get to tell the story we get to choose which stories we tell so you know absolutely understanding how renewables sit within an ongoing story, which includes oil, which includes peat. You know, a lot of people who came into the sector, the renewable sector, came from the offshore oil and gas industry because they had expertise in that sector, which was transferable. And, you know, th the same issues are going to come about around what, what we do with this technology, having it is one thing, what we do with it is, is the bigger question. Well, that is the, the end of the questions I've got in the chat. We do have some time left if anyone would like to submit any more questions. Um, and while people are thinking I might abuse my role yet again uh, and ask uh, Becky another question, in terms of taking this the next step, and this is possibly a cruel question to ask someone that's only a month out of submission when it should just <laughs> all be cocktails on the beach and nothing else. But uh, how would you how would you take this forward? So the thing that I didn't particularly talk about so much tonight, but death that comes out of this research is this. I suppose it does come out tonight. It's, it's about stories and how we tell the stories, but also how we translate the stories for other people and how that I suppose coming back a little bit to the question that Dan asked about how how we how we make that story travel to other places and to wider contexts. So my particular interest is around how you get more voices involved in telling the story. One of the issues that um, I became very aware of was the way that we. It's very easy to talk about the Orkney community and talk about, you know, what's happening here in terms of the shiny headline technology innovation stuff. And as I said in the talk, miss out all the invisible interpersonal work, which I would argue is completely and utterly foundational to, to the technology working. So, you know, people want to know how to re how to replicate what's happened in Orkney. Well, if you only talk about the technology and the innovation and you miss out the, so the, the interpersonal social technology 
you know, the care is a living technology stuff, then you're not going to be able to re replicate Orkney anyway because you're talking about different people in different places. But if you miss out the social stuff, then you're missing out a whole load of learning. And that learning is about understanding situated knowledges. It's about understanding local expertise, which comes from deep, committed, ongoing relationships to place and people and community as process. And, and so it's that kind of stuff that I'm really interested in how the stuff that I've been looking at around ecological dialogism and how you look at language and how you start to problematize the way we use language to talk about the technology, how that can be used in places where we've got this interest from outside into the community, whether that's academic researchers or policy makers or technology developers, businesses coming in, how can the community's voice be heard and how can we bring into that community voice a greater range of voices? So it's not just the usual suspects, it's not just the obvious people with authority, and existing authority and power, but actually something that which, which is much more sustainable, much more grassroots, much more community designed and led. The silent voices as well as the uh, authoritative ones. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to hearing more about that in the uh, months and years ahead. Um, I don't think we have any more questions coming up in the chat. So unless anyone has a, a final dash to the keyboard, um, there's lots of messages coming in just saying thank you very much, Becky, for the talk. Um, if there aren't any more questions, um, I will start to bring things to a close. But before I do that, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanks virtually, unfortunately, uh, to Dr. Ford for a fantastic paper and discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Awkward thank round you. of applause, so it's just me, but I hope it will do for now.